Hello and welcome to Surviving Scientology Radio. This is Jeffrey Augustine. My wife Karen and I wanted to start Surviving Scientology Radio as a way to cover breaking news and to also do more in-depth interviews than our Surviving Scientology YouTube channel allows. We look forward to having many exciting broadcasts in the future. Our guest today on our inaugural broadcast is Mike Rinder. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeff. Pleasure to be here. I'm glad to have you. Mike, I wanted to uh, interview you for many reasons. Uh, Jillian Schlesinger is a big surprise. She looks great on video, very intelligent, and frankly, the pushback Karen and I got from OSA for doing this surprised us. Jillian had only been gone three weeks. She contacted Karen by finding us on the Internet. What do you make of the pushback from OSA? Well, Jeff, you know, the any time there is something that generates that sort of a reaction and, uh, and response from the church, it means that it's something that they're seriously worried about. I mean, they've got so many problems happening right now and so many things going on around the world that it has to be some major catas- cataclysmic uh, event for them to to respond in any way, shape, or form. You'll notice these days they don't even respond to the majority of media inquiry they get. So when you see a reaction like the reaction that happened with, with Jillian, you know that she's hit a nerve. And the reason that she has hit a nerve, in my estimation, is that she is so current. And she demonstrates that it is, in fact, possible for someone to walk out the door or escape from uh, the Sea Org and virtually overnight become a whistleblower. And that has got to be terrifying because for many, many, many years, uh, the climate was such that when people left, they were worried about what might happen if they spoke out and so they would be you know it would take them you know people have called this a decompression period or whatever but it would take a while before they felt comfortable enough to be able to speak and because of that time passing it it would tend to create uh, problems uh, if anybody has sought to bring a legal action because of statute of limitations, it would create problems. I know the FBI had a big problem with things are too old. We need current people that have current stories. So I think that Jillian uh, is a, a, a reflection of the concern that the church has that not only she can create damage, but that she may set a, a precedent for others to follow in her footsteps. Mike, you raise a couple interesting points in that uh, very articulate response. First of all, the FBI does want uh, current things, as do other agencies. 2010 Ford, there are statute of limitations. Secondly, the church has in the past tended to attack whistleblowers as old news. Old news, nobody's. She's very current, and I think three weeks in, people who are still in the church, who are in the Sea Org in particular, can see her. They know her, and that's that's a threat to them. Uh, the other issue you raise, whistleblowers in general, as many of us have saw on the Internet, it was leaked, the new non-disparagement agreement. Yes. Whereby the church seeks to, what, fine you $50,000 if you disparage them. For me, this was very striking. I spent 30 years in corporate life. I was the Western Regional Manager for a major division of a large uh, international company. And non-disparagement clauses I only ever saw or signed in my position as an executive in relationship to businesses doing business with each other. So, you know, let's say a giant a giant like IBM and Microsoft enter into a deal. They agree not to disparage each other if a lawsuit arises. So for a church, and, and I do view the Church of Scientology as a religion very much made by lawyers. It's by and about lawyers. 
How do we handcuff people? How do we take away their rights? For them to issue a non-disparagement clause says a lot about their fear. What does it say to you that they're actually requiring people to sign this? Um, what it says to me, Jeff, is that a, a number of things. One, they have such a fear now of information leaking out, and it leaks all over the place, and it gets on the Internet, and it gets into the media. They don't even have... Uh, the control that they used to have over the media because people are just not intimidated by their endless, toothless threats. But it also tells me that they uh, – there was a, a, a court ruling that I consider was extremely significant in the California Court of Appeals in the Laura Dykeman case um, – and without going into a lot of technical details, it hasn't gotten a lot of attention, but it effectively said that the uh, documents that people are forced to sign when they leave the Sea Org really are not only just useless, but they serve to toll the statute of limitations because they incorrectly create the impression that People who have left have no rights or ability to sue any church organization. Now, one of the things that they are trying to do with the non-disparagement agreement is get it signed before someone starts or when they sign up for staff because all of these agreements have pretty much been invalidated because people have walked in. I mean, if you look at the Debbie Cook testimony in San Antonio, she walks in and says, well, yeah, I signed it, but I would have signed anything to get out of there. And that's a very true statement. People, uh, when they've been trying to route out for months or they've been chased down and dragged, kicking and screaming back for more sex checking, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they will virtually do and sign anything to get out the door. And that then invalidates the agreements that they sign as being uh, done under duress. So they are turning that around and saying, good, we'll have people sign them beforehand, when they first sign up for staff or during the time of staff, not when they're trying to leave, and we'll have them locked in then. But the truth of the matter is, I don't think that any of those things will hold up in a court of law because... There, you know, there's no consideration. They don't have attorneys representing them. They don't have the, you know, there are a lot of reasons why. But nevertheless, the church believes that those things have value because of their interorum effect, that people believe that they can't disparage or talk or say anything. And so many will not. There are a few who will be smart enough to figure out, well, that doesn't have any any uh, legal teeth, and I'm not going to be held to anything that was signed under those circumstances. But the vast majority of people will consider that, well, I'm stuck because I signed that contract or I signed that non-disparagement agreement, even though, you know, a lawyer would look at it and the circumstances under which it was signed and say, this is a joke. You're never going to be able to make that thing stick. But the church doesn't care. They won't make it stick. They'll make it stick with 90, 95, 99 percent of the people and figure that they're way ahead of the game because there'll only be one percent that will be smart enough to figure out that it really doesn't have any purpose or significance. So what you're really talking about is a church attempt at damage control by use of uh, an unconscionable contract or what you could call a contract of adhesion whereby one party has all the power and the other side does not. And this this element to control people through intimidating them, making them sign contracts on video, for me as a, a former corporate executive, I look at it two ways. First, a CERG member legally is a volunteer who receives a stipend. They're not an employee. So I would ask, one, can you make a volunteer in a religious organization that has no legal standing? Because according to David Miscavige's lawyer in Como County, Texas, the Sea Org does not exist. Uh, I note that Lamont Jefferson said the Sea Org does not have an address, does not have stationery. You can't give it orders because there's no one to take an order from. So then 
you start looking at the Church of Scientology International enforcing a contract on a member of a religious order that doesn't exist. And the value, if it's only to threaten the person in the event they ever escape, what does that say about the church? They're fundamentally exploiting somebody from the very beginning by not letting them consult with legal counsel prior to signing the contract. And they're going to try to enforce it or at least, you know, call the person and threaten them if they do blow. One thing that's always struck me about the church, Mike, it's all one sided. It's like a rigged casino. Everything goes in favor of the house. You can't win in Scientology as a Sea Org member. You can't win as a parishioner. So the, the contract, I agree, Jeff. Uh, well, you, you lived the reality for a long time. It's all very one-sided. Uh, and this leads me to my second point. Last week, I posted the IRS 990T filings. It showed uh, what, you know, what the Church of Scientology's book value is worth. Church of Scientology International book value, uh, $790 million plus. You add in Church of Spiritual Technology, you're up to $1.2 billion, and you're still climbing by the time you add flag, you're around $1.5 billion. What do you think will be the effect, in your opinion, of the release of this kind of publicly available information? especially the tax, uh, the tax uh, filings? I think that it will make a lot of people... Um, I think it'll, it'll have different effects on different people, Jeff, but here is what, what uh, I believe is going to happen. I believe that it will uh, be a vehicle to use to show to people who are sitting on the the fence or not quite sure about what they want to do or they, they don't want to believe anything that's said by an SP. The beauty of those documents is that they're church documents and they're not disputable. They are filings that are made with the IRS. It is hard and has got to be hard for those people and you know that the, the vast majority of people who are still involved in the what I call the fundamentalist church, are constantly hounded for money. And they got to look at that and go, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, why are they, why are they, you know, get going after me for my last thousand dollars when they've got, you know, one and a half billion dollars and that doesn't even include the IAS? What, you know, what's going on here? Why do they keep, why do they keep collecting money? Why aren't they, why aren't they spending the money? And this, well, yeah, I'm saying this, this, is, this is a crucial point, Mike Rinder. Uh, the church has at least $1.5 billion book value, and, and it's climbing. I just found the, uh, what's called the um, Social, Betterment, uh, Social Betterment Properties International. They're, they are the part of the Church of Scientology that just spent $5 million, I think, last year to buy the actor Larry Hagman's estate at the top of Ojai, California. Yep. They had $5 billion in cash. I didn't even know about uh, Social Betterment Properties International. And the way when you're, when you're in the church, certainly, uh, they're always telling you there's a dire emergency and they need money now. Yet, if you look at their wealth, just what we know of through these public filings, there's no financial emergency. There's no dire <laughs> crisis where you have to have money now, 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 now. And uh, I, by the way, I did enjoy Chris Shelton bringing out that point on his recent video. Now, now, now. Everything's now, now, now. Uh, this could be a make or break for people deciding, I'm not going to take out a mortgage on my house. There's no crisis. I'm not going to drain my children's college funds. Exactly. Exactly. That was exactly the point that I was trying to make that you just articulated. I think that this is something that people who are in the church who are being hit for money all the time, all the time, and it's always the desperate, you've you got to give us your last $1,000, are going to look at that and go, wait a minute, why would I be giving them my last $1,000? Why don't they spend one of their one point $5 billion and instead of bankrupting me. So I think that that's, that those documents are extremely important. 
Secondarily, I think that they are extremely important because I believe that what they have done is raised public awareness on the issue of what is the real scene within the Church of Scientology and all of its related entities and activities. Is this really a legitimate 501c3 that's operating for the public benefit or not? And while the IRS may have, you know, cold feet about going after the church, you start exposing things like this and putting them into the to the public record, and sooner or later the result is going to be someone reaches a politician or a person of influence somewhere who calls up the IRS commissioner or someone high up in the IRS and says, hey, you know, what the hell is going on here? What is, wh- how is this possible, and what are you doing about it? And at which point, then the, you know, the ball will start to roll, and there will be consequences. Because the truth of the matter is, I believe that the accumulation of that amount of money and not being spent on public benefit activities, but simply accumulated is a direct violation of the IRS code with respect to requirements for a a 501c3. I agree with you on that point. uh, Certainly 501c3s cannot hoard money. I've thought for many years now that part of the ideal org org program was they have to spend some money, so why not purchase real estate? Even if there's no one there, they can at least show the IRS they're trying to do something. But the issue of financial transparency is so very vital. The Church of Scientology has never been financially transparent with its own membership, let alone the public. And there are many great sites out there that uh, have compiled documents, and I started, I, I added to those sites by starting a new WordPress blog called the Scientology Money Project, and I'll be publicizing it shortly. And what my aim to do is to compile in one place as many uh, current documents as I can get, and then link to the existing sites that have older 990Ts. For example, I found the RTC Incorporation documents, and there are memos. So. Scientology is made of lawyers, and then underneath that, there's a handful of officials like Ellen Reynolds, Lynn Farney, Alan Cartwright, people whose names we're seeing now in filings and in court uh, documents. Mm-hmm. I think if, if people can really see how the structure works, how it's intentionally designed to be convoluted, evasive, not answer, that that, puts, that will uh, give people materials for future court actions. It'll give government officials certainly documents to provide them. And I think one thing that's important for our listeners to understand, this is what I've called for a long time the invisible audience. You never know who's going to read your material, but you have to have faith in the fact that it does get out there, it gets read, and you never know when that one document or that one thing you say will be very, very useful. Micah, your uh, blog has been so successful. I'm very impressed by the quality and content of what you're doing. Uh, and your coverage, and i got to tell you, your coverage in the last year uh, or so of South Africa is really stunning. What is your take on the Church of Scientology and South Africa? Um, I think that it is the the sort of microcosm of the situation with the church all over the world, frankly, Jeff. I think that South Africa sort of in – because it's a a pretty small and isolated community, it's relatively easy to see and get a good picture of what's going on there. Uh, Things tend to be spread out in other places and – because there are certain people down there who have been in such uh, positions of influence who have you know, seen what's going on and walked away, and then the heavy-handed efforts of, of the church to you know, get those wayward children back under control by, by squashing them, and the net result has been that they have 
pretty much destroyed whatever they had of the church in South Africa because they, you know, very clearly violated the the rule of don't uh, go after opinion leaders because they went after some of the biggest opinion leaders in South Africa. And what ends up happening is the, you know, Miscavige and the church are very, very U.S. centric. If it's not happening in the United States, it's not really important. And that's been the case for a very, very long time. And I think that they, you, you know, Miscavige looks at the situations like South Africa and just, you know, believes that there is a blanket answer for everything. Oh, we'll just declare them and, you know, that'll teach them a lesson and, and burn out the cancer and, you know, treat them, just say no and treat them rough, their SPs and blah, 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 without ever thinking through the consequences because the consequences aren't as uh, magnified and and clearly visible at, in the U.S. as they are in that very, very small community in South Africa. And so we've seen a lot of things that have come out of South Africa that are telling the real story about what's going on, the real story about what's going on inside the two quote-unquote ideologues they have there, the real story about what's going on with the public and how many and what percentage of the public is actually sitting under the radar, n not supporting the church, but not overtly walking away from it, and what percentage are uh, thoroughly disabused with whatever it comes from the you know whatever is coming from the United States and i think that the, that it's a it's a little um a little window into the world that is not as clearly visible anywhere else although you can see the same signs all over the place you know you you go Look at any of the orgs around the world or, any, you know, virtually anything that's going on inside the church, and it's, it's pretty rotten, meaning things are, are being chewed away from the inside out, and they're, you know, it's like a termite infestation, and the, the walls are still standing, but the, the inside is just rotting away, and people are abandoning it in, in droves, and... You just don't see it as quite as plainly as what's been on display in South Africa. No, and you, you make a good point that it is a microcosm. One of the fundamental problems of the Church of Scientology is that stats, statistics, are due every Thursday at 2 p.m. I think the idea that you must make more money every week or you'll get punished, the Church itself is self-destructive in this way. In, in, in other words, it becomes a very high-pressure extraction machine where they want money, life, energy. They want everything every week, and it's hard to sustain that. And I, I, South Africa is a really very vivid uh, – it shows everything that's wrong with the church. For example, they sent a Sea Org mission down there to do what? To handle people? To tell them not to go on the Internet? To declare them? Uh, the Sea Org handling – what actually goes on on a Sea Org handling or what is supposed to happen versus what actually happened? Because to me, reading your blog, talking to people in South Africa, it looked like the Sea Org mission was a complete and total disaster. <laughs> so what was supposed to happen versus what actually happened? Well, what was supposed to happen was that they were supposed to, to walk in with the old, you know, Dirk in the desk routine and everybody would be intimidated and back down and quietly shuffle off never to be heard from again and that just isn't the reality of the world these days the old heavy-handed techniques and routines that for years were the mainstay of sealed missions today just become uh, a uh, you know the subject of the newest expose that that goes all over the internet so well, now this is, this is an interesting thing you see, and I want to give our, our listeners a little 
eye, uh, little window into the church. When you say dirk in the dagger, this actually means a dirk or a small knife that's designed to throw. They actually do that, or they used to, right? They used to actually take a knife and throw it into the ceiling or a desk? Yeah, absolutely. A Sea Org mission would walk into an area, and to establish their presence in the area would take a dagger and jam it into the desk. Like, here we are. And it would be pulled out once the the scene had been, uh, you know, straightened out to their satisfaction. So you would, I mean, here in the U.S., if you threw uh, a knife into someone's desk, that could either be assault with a deadly weapon or brandishing a deadly weapon. And to me, this sort of uh, throwing a knife in, near a person's body, uh, it shows the, the disregard that, and the unreality the church has for things. You know, lock people up, throw daggers, scream. Uh, in the total disconnect they have with culture and the norms of culture, the normative behavior of culture, I know that in, in, in corporate life, when you had a problem, you might send some executives out to handle things and have a word of prayer behind closed doors. Never any screaming, never brutality. And certainly, uh, if you didn't like your job, you could always resign and, and you know, uh, the corporation wouldn't go after you and hound you uh, <laughs> and pound you. So it, it, it does show a pretty big disconnect. Mike, uh, what do you expect to see in the short term? Well, you know, by way of concluding, what do you see, expect to see in the next three to six months based on the trends? Any predictions? I expect to see a, a sort of a, an increase in the, the erosion of the, the apparency of this, you know, uh, monolithic organization that you know controls all i think that there will be more jillions who will surface i think that there will be more media exposés i think that the church has lost its grip on the media um not a, by that i mean they not only are no longer able to intimidate media into not writing about them as uh had happened for quite a long time but they don't even have anybody that they can have represent the church, so their voice isn't heard at all. They don't respond to any media, so nothing ever gets said on the church's behalf other than stupid letters that get sent that look like they're written by attorneys, and they probably were. If not attorneys, they were written by David Miscavige. So I think that we're going to see more media exposés, and I think that we're going to see more... Uh, leaking of internal materials from within the church. I mean, they are going crazy. I, I'm, you know, I, shortly I'm going to be doing a post about the new measures that have been taken to try and stem the leaks, because everything that is going on uh, is now just kind of making its way out onto the internet, onto my blog or on Tony Ortega's blog or into the media or, where, you know, wherever. It's like there's sort of a, 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 a big demand for that information. So uh, it gets out and there are more and more people who are seeing that this is, you know, more and more people who actually have access to this information who are now seeing, hey, this is actually an effective thing that can be done to change the stuff that I don't like. <laughs> They've never had, people have never had a means of changing anything within the Church of Scientology before. And now they do. And th that is, uh, you know, why so many people now are stepping forward, or not even stepping forward. They, often they don't even disclose who they are. It just, stuff just shows up anonymously. And here is a new piece of information that just, you know, flew in a, a, you know, dropped down the chimney by the stalk. And it's very interesting, and it discloses what's really going on inside. Well, Mike, it certainly gives... Uh, uh irony to Scientology's one of their favorite quotes, something can be done about it, and certainly something can be done about it, and our, I urge our listeners to do something about it, and the uh, uh, is very interesting uh, it, very interesting to watch and narrate the collapse of uh, the Church of Scientology in real time. 
Mike, thank you for being our special guest today on the inaugural broadcast of Surviving Scientology Radio. We hope to speak with you and interview you again in the near future. Looking forward to it, Jeff, and good, good luck with this new program. Well, thank you, and uh, we'll be in very good touch. That's it for our broadcast of survivingscientologyradio.com. We will have uh, more broadcasts in the near future on some very interesting events. Thank you for tuning in.